Hello and welcome back to the channel. You've joined myself, Dr. James Gill, for another clinical skills video, but one with a slight difference, as you're about to find out. Today we're going to be looking at how to perform the cannulation procedure, so how to put um, intravenous access into a patient so that we can provide them with medications, fluids, and all the steps that we need to go through in terms of making that a safe procedure, both for yourself as the practitioner, but also for uh, the patient. So um, I'm going to run through the detail of how we do the cannulation, and then a Thavra and myself, who is fully trained on how to do cannulas, is going to cannulate my scrawny limbs. So we'll see how we do with that. With that in mind, let's have a look at how we actually go about doing the cannulation. So we want to ideally find out what's the non-dominant hand of the patient. So it's all well and good putting a cannula on somebody's wrist or on their antecubital fossa if this is their main arm. So we want to be using an arm that's not going to get in the way of the rest of the time whilst we are caring for that patient. Once we've identified where we're going to go with that, we're going to prepare our kit. So we need to make sure that we um, alcohol gel our hands, and now there is a, um, a school of thought that some uh, practitioners will um, go ahead and do their cannulation sans gloves. I would strongly suggest that you find the appropriate size gloves for yourself and wear them during the cannulation. Remember, you only need to get infective blood on a hand and into a cut once for it to potentially change your life. So I would recommend safety first, wear your gloves. Once we've got our safety kit for ourselves, we want to get the cannulation kit. Different institutions may require you to collect the um, kit that you require. Some may provide you with cannulation packs. If you're doing it yourself, you want to make sure you have your sharp spin to hand. So again, safety first, we want to make sure we have the ability to dispose of the used sharps. Once we've got that, we can actually go get the sharp in order to use. So identify which cannula you want. Do you want a slightly larger green if we've got an emergency situation? Or if we've got a little old lady or a child, then we're perhaps going to go for a blue cannula. Much smaller and generally going to be less uncomfortable. We want to have our chlorhexidine and alcohol swab to um, disinfect the area. There's plenty of evidence to say that these combination um, uh, swabs are more effective at sterilization and preventing wound infection uh, at the cannula site than just an alcohol swab on its own. So there's two forms of chlorhexidine and alcohol swabs. We've got the uh, ones with the glass vial on the left and the applicator sponge, and then the straightforward um, alcohol wipe on the left. Personally, I prefer those with the glass release um, just because I think that they're a little bit more superior, um, but either can be used quite effectively. We want to make sure we've got our tegaderm in order to cover over the uh, cannula once it's put in. And two very crucial things, we want to have our um, syringe and our saline flush in order to clear the cannula of blood once we've used it. In cannulation packs, you'll often find a, um, a sterile field, which will allow you to put the things on the table for easy access. Then we're going to open up the aseptic field. And then inside we should have our cannula. We're going to have a, another aseptic field. We'll have our sterile um, gauze. We've got our alcohol and chlorhexidine scrub, which is much better than using alcohol on its own, our tegaderm, and crucially, we've got our um, disposal bag, which we're going to stick to the front of our um, workstation so that we can easily make sure that we're collecting all the bits as we go along. One of the other things that there is debate about is regarding the tourniquet to be used. I would argue that you should use a disposable tourniquet. I would argue the easiest way to use these disposable cannulas is with a small loop. Once you've put the cannula in and you're wanting to cap the end, you can simply pull the loop to release the pressure and allow you to apply the cap to the cannula without significant blood loss. Some individuals will use old um, reusable tourniquets where you're clipping it around the arm. 
There may be a debate as to whether or not they're more comfortable for the patient, but they're certainly an infection control hazard, and I wouldn't want one applied to myself if I was having a cannula, and you're going to be seeing the disposable one used here. Once we've actually got our kit ready to go, how are we going to approach the patient? So here's one we created earlier. But as with all things, just because somebody on the ward has said, could you go and cannulate Mr. X, we need to make sure we've got the right patient. So my name's Dr. Gill. I've been asked to uh, perform a cannulation on yourself. That's going to involve putting a small plastic rod into your arm. There will be a little bit of discomfort and some bleeding when we pierce the skin with the initial needle. Uh, before we go ahead, can you please confirm your name and date of birth? Thomas Harvey, 4th of January 2000. Super. And is this something that you're expecting to go ahead? Yes. Superb. So, um, can you please confirm, are you right or left-handed? I'm left-handed. So, we're going to apply the cannula to the patient's right arm, and I'm getting my uh, tourniquet, and I'm just going to apply that to the patient initially, and I'm wrapping that around with a small loop. The reason being is I can then easily release that tourniquet as easily as the old-fashioned ones with a clip-on. So putting that back on, and I'm going to start the, um, the tourniquet whilst I'm getting my things ready. Then we'll get our chlorhexidine wipe. We um, have the wings either side and a glass vial inside. We um, squeeze them, which clacks the uh, glass, bringing the um, disinfectant out to the end of the swab and we're going to rub it in a circular motion starting from the centre of the hand all the way out so we're not covering the same area and if we are pulling any bacteria, skin cells, that's going to come out with us. Once we've covered the area, we're going to get our cannula, opening it up. With some cannulas, you can actually remove the cap at the start um, before you go ahead and remove the cannula needle during the um, insertion process and then you can apply the cap to the actual cannula kit afterwards. However, um, some um, pre-made cannula kits may have a separate cap. They also may have what's called an octopus that you can apply to the end that would allow multiple different um, medications to be provided at the same time. And we're going to hold it with the wings down initially, and then I'm going to hold between my thumb and middle finger. That means that my index finger is available to pull back on the needle as needed, so I have extra control. So we're keeping the hand below the patient's um, heart. We can apply an additional um, sterile field underneath the patient, so that can be useful to catch any uh, blood if we make any issues. Remember, there's always a possibility of things going wrong. So when we start using the cannula, we want to remove the cap and put it on our sterile field. We'll need that in a moment or two. So we can see where we think that uh, we're going to be going in. We can see a, a, confl a confluence here. If you can make a fist for me and just pump the hand a little. That can often improve the veins, and we can definitely see where we were going here. In terms of the vein, I'm going to actually stabilise the skin with one hand, and we can see how wonderfully straight that vein is going to be to go in. So we can see here we've got some reasonable uh, blood vessels. So I can tap on those. Doing so will actually release uh, vasodilators, so it may make the blood vessels more apparent. Then we're going to use the alcohol wipe, and we're starting in the center, coming round, all the way out. And I can see here we've got a nice Y shape. So I will remove the um, sheath from the cannula. So I'm going to stabilize the skin underneath, and I'm going to approach at a five to 10 degree angle at the confluence here. At that point, once I've got flashback in the needle, I'm going to move to a much shallower angle as I pull back the needle and push the cannula further in. Once we've removed the needle and we've placed it in the sharp spin, I'm going to cover the press, put pressure over the end of the, um, the, the vein that we're in. I'm going to get the um, cap and I'm going to apply that to the end of the cannula. Given the nature of the beveled appearance on the cannula, I'm only going to be cutting or piercing with the very bottom of the cannula. There's a possibility that we can actually pierce through the top and the bottom of the blood vessel. So bursting the vessel, that will mean our cannula's failed at that point. We can often get it back, but it is slightly difficult. 
However, if we remember that we're only cutting with the bottom edge, as soon as we go in, so we've got our flashback, we can drastically reduce our angle, knowing that we will not cut the top of the vessel with the, um, the cannula, and that will allow us a lot more maneuverability inside the vein to um, push the cannula in. When the needle has been removed from the cannula, you'll see this sort of sheath spring onto the end of the cannula with the intention of reducing sharps injuries. Whilst these are very, very useful, it should not be considered appropriate to delay the application of the needle into the nearest sharps bin as soon as humanly possible in order to guarantee there's no risk to others from the used sharp. Once we have the cannula on, we're going to take our tegaderm. You'll find two stickers. Uh, these are for applying to the wings of the cannula to hold it in place, and crucially, the date when the cannula was inserted. Uh, we're going to apply the tegaderm all the way to the point where the cannula contacts the skin. That way we're hopefully providing a seal to reduce the risk of infection. We want to make sure that we've accurately written the date the tegaderm and the cannula is applied, so we know that the cannula doesn't go out of date, and then we're going to apply this over the top of the patient. Once we've done that, our used sharps are obviously going to go in the uh, bin and we are going to remove the uh, tourniquet. At this point, we will get our flush. We're going to um, uh, flush the cannula, return the cap and leave the patient to what they're doing for the rest of the day and prepare our medications, whatever is to go in through the cannula. So that's how to do it. Let's see how he does, shall we? <laughs> okay, so there's been a slight um, re-evaluation of the rules. Athava has um, attempted to cannulate me. Um, clearly, I'm not quite as uh, effective teacher as I thought I was. Um, so I'm currently holding my hand, not because he's injured me, but because it'll take a minute or two for me to be able to take the pressure off. If nothing else, this is a good point that when you remove a cannula, make sure you p apply significant pressure over the exit site to stop it potentially bleeding, as is the case here. But in terms of um, you know, adjustment of rules, I am now going to cannulate the Thava. He's had a go on me, and at the end of the day, we do need to produce an educational video. So the first thing we want to do is apply the tourniquet. We're going to go up round and down, keeping it nice and tight as we do so. This means that uh, we can easily release the tourniquet without causing any issues to the patient. So have I put that back on again? Then we start to have a look to see what we can find. We can see the veins, yes, but what we need to do is find veins that are easily palpable. We can get the patient to flex their hand and that can bring some of these uh, veins to the fore. We could get the bifurcation here in the, in the wrist. Some patients prefer that because it leaves the hand free. We can tap on the uh, wrist a couple of times and that can bring the vein to the fore. We're then going to put the antiseptic wipe on the hand and moving round from the centre out. As the uh, antiseptic is dry, we're going to repair the cannula, folding the wings down, then we want to pull the skin on the wrist as we dorsiflex the wrist. This tethering of the wrist will help going in at five degrees and then adjusting as we go up. We can see a little bit of flashback there and we can begin to pull the needle backwards. As we do, in advancing the cannula into the arm, as we pull the needle off, we're going to occlude the cannula to mean that we don't get any uh, leakage and we're going to apply the cap to the back of the cannula. Once this is in, we want to uh, release the tourniquet and then we're going to prepare our flush. So advance the cannula fully, put the flush to the um, cannula and flush. So we know that we've got an easy flush so there's no problems. At this point, we now want to tether down the cannula putting the um, first strips over the wings, holding it in place. That keeps things nice and secure. Then we're getting the main tegaderm, applying over the insertion site. 
So that way things have been covered and it reduces the risk of any infections to that wound site. And we're coming round again to touch across the front of the port. We're going to remove the outer part of the tegaderm, saving the outer part which contains the date and we'll remove the overall part of the film. Then we're going to close the port and we're going to apply the um, date to the cannula. Some people do apply them higher up, but it's much better to apply them low down under the port so that we can see the cannula site at all points in case we get evidence of infection, such as erythema. When it comes to removing the cannula, we obviously want to uh, remove the, uh, the date and we're going to press down over the cannula and being very careful with the tegaderm because the cannula will move and will be uncomfortable. So pressing down all the while. Then we're going to get our sterile gauze, covering the end of the cannula. One, two, three, retracting and applying. And we're done and dusted. At this point, we'll just get some tape and stick that down. So you may have seen something that looks ever so slightly different from what we just started with. Um, there's something called the cannula yips, where when you get it wrong, um, it's very difficult to get back on track. Unfortunately, the uh, plan didn't quite work out, and, uh, well, I now have a couple of marks on my hand. Now, there's no problem with that, and in your um, time at medical school, you will run into an issue where you drop the ball and you miss a cannula. One of the things that's really, really important to do is get back on the horse. So let's put it in my own experience. When I was uh, at medical school, I was on the urology ward and I was asked to go and get a, put a cannula in a patient and I failed and I felt really bad. And then I tried to do the next and I failed and I felt really, really bad. And then I failed the third cannula in a row and I was absolutely distraught. And I had a fantastic registrar at the time, and they reassured me and said, look, you are so worried about hurting them, James, but think about what you're doing. You're going to get a bit of metal and shove it in their arm. You can't not hurt them. So appreciate that you will cause some discomfort, but that's for the benefit of the patient. And to make sure that you get over the cannula lips, James, I'm going to send all the cannulas throughout the ward to you today, even if you have to stay late. I'll give you all the support you need, but you're going to do the cannulas. That was a terrifying day for me, and it was one of the best days of my medical education. That registrar was with me throughout, making sure that I, when I failed, that he was there to help, to reassure, to explain what I was doing wrong, and to succeed in the cannulas. It was a very difficult day, but I am confident doing cannulas now. If you drop the ball, if you don't get the cannulas, it's vitally important not to give up and keep going. This is a manual skill. The more you do it, the more confident you'll be with how you put the tourniquet on, how you manipulate your hands, how the cannula goes in and then push along, what you're doing with the bevel, how you're pulling back the actual needle. Okay? These are bread and butter skills for junior doctors. So don't be worried if you don't get it the first time. Be confident, be calm, apologise to the patient and do it again. And if you do find that on that patient you can't do it, that's fine. Go get a senior, go get somebody else to help you. But make sure you stay and see how they have done it and learn so that you can do it again on the next one. It is vitally important that we try and do cannulas for the benefit of the patient on real patients. When we start off, we can do you know, T-Docs where we're using artificial limbs, and that's a great baseline to understand what we're doing with our hands. But it's so much easier to uh, put a cannula in an artificial arm than it is a real person. We have to get out on the wards and do these things. Well, I hope that's been a useful video for you, uh, even if you'll uh, excuse these fewer uh, cinematic changes in order to get it through. If you've liked the video, please um, you know, put some comments down below about other things that we can help you with regard to your clinical practice as you go through medical school. With that in mind, definitely thanks to Athava, both for his own terrifying uh, experience trying to candidate me and also for the fact that he donated his arm in the end. So thanks again. Take care. We'll see you in the next one. Cheerio.